Welcome to an introduction to Chess 101. This is probably the easiest class that you would ever take at any university. Today, I'll take you to the realm of chess for the next 18 minutes. I'm not quite sure how to do that, but you know, let's give it a try. Pretty much everyone knows what chess is and how it's played and looked and all that, but people tend to have different perspectives on what the game really is about. There's definitely some sort of stereotypes going on here, so let's take a look at them first. For example, what does social media or Hollywood think of chess? Well, they think of chess as a game of high intelligence. Oftentimes you'll see in the movies that chess is utilized to show an extraordinary mind or memory with unlimited capacity. Intense chess battles all the time occur in these movies. In fact, way more intense than a normal game that you'll see in real life. And you'll see all those actions in the first movie of Harry Potter or in the final scene of Sherlock Holmes. And the list goes on forever. What about friends? You know, what do they think of chess? Speaking from my own experience, I think they think of chess as probably the most boring game ever made on Earth. And they think that there's no other game in this world that can surpass chess with its boredom level. And at the end of the day, they still call, call themselves that they're my friends, even though they know that this is my favorite game. And we'll see how that works. Well, you know, moving on, what about parents? You know, what do they think of chess? Well, they think of chess as something that's just, you know, plain good for them. In exactly what way it's good for them, they don't really know, but they still think that playing chess can't really go wrong. And lastly, what about me? What do I think of chess? Well, what does chess really mean to me? And that's what I'm sharing with you today. Talking about chess would be equivalent to talking about its opening lines, mid-game techniques, and end-game strategies. However, if you haven't played chess extensively before, then talking about them, first of all, might not mean much to you, and second of all, I might actually, bored, I might actually get you bored to death. So let's not do that. And I thought the best way to explain it is to go through a couple of interesting facts about chess and see what we can get out of it. So without much further ado, let's you know, dive into those facts. Fact one, chess is a game full of possibilities. It is a back and forth sequential strategy game. You make a move, your opponent makes a move, and then you make a move, and it goes on, right? But any situation, at any given situation or board position, there are many different board positions. So in order for you to calculate the best move or to find the best move, you need to take into account all the different possible move options that your opponent will have to make against your response. So basically, the one who can outthink the others, or in this case, the one who can calculate most moves ahead, essentially wins the game. Doesn't that naturally make you wonder how many different board positions there are at a given situation? Well, here you go. I've done the math. I've actually looked it up. And it says, after one move each, black makes a move and white makes a move, or the other way around, there are exactly 400 different board positions that you can have on the board. And only after two moves each, that number skypes, spikes up to around 72,000 board positions. Isn't that crazy? And after three moves each, we're already talking about nine million different board positions. So does anyone want to have a guess on the number of different board positions that you can have after four moves each? Anyone? All right. It's going to be around 318 billion different positions. It's so crazy. And if you believe that, on average, a game of chess takes about 40 moves, then it gives you 10 to the power of 120 different board positions that you have to calculate. This number is ridiculously high that it doesn't even make any sense to me anymore. But if I can, you know, think of anything that's relatively close to this number, then we're talking about all the electrons that you can find in this whole universe. And that's only giving you 10 to the power of 79. And this shows how complex this game of chess is, and this also shows how this game of chess can never be fully studied. Fact two, chess in ancient times was, was used to be called a game of kings. It is because for many centuries, it was primarily played by kings and, you know, high elites. But nowadays, it seems as if only, you know, nerds like me or old people at the garden seem to play. And the rest is occupied by technology, or basketball, or even video games like, we all know it, Dota. Fact three, chess 
is closely intertwined with artificial intelligence. Alan Turing, a British mathematician, also seen in this movie called The Imitation Game, is considered to be the founder of artificial intelligence and computer science. He's most known for his effort in creating a computing machine during World War II at Britain's code-breaking center. And his later called Turing machine eventually broke German ciphers and helped Britain win the war. But what he's lesser known for is that, the something that I'm more interested in, is that he also created the first computer chess program. And I, for someone who's been playing chess for this amount of years near professional level, witnessed the strength of artificial intelligence improve with the speed of light over the years. In good times, once upon a time, chess programs were not that good, and human intelligence used to govern chess. However, the whole world was put in shock when Garry Kasparov, inarguably the best player in the history of chess, was defeated by an artificial intelligence deep blue in 1997. And since then, chess programs have only grown stronger, and human intelligence is simply no match with them. However, that's not the end of the world for us. It's not the end of the world for chess players, because now, with the assistance of chess programs, our games have become much more analytical, and we have way more in-depth analysis. The only downside is that there's literally no room left for us to make the smallest mistake in this competitive chess field. And last fact, people tend to have an idea that, you know, playing chess makes you smarter. I'm not sure if I enti entirely agree with that because that wasn't the case for me. But nevertheless, you know, there's still a positive correlation between human intelligence and chess. So I found a list of top 10 people with the highest IQ in history. And if you take a look at the list, we have some well-known people like Leonardo da Vinci sitting at seven with an IQ score of 180, and we also have masterminds like Albert Einstein with a relative score of 160, and we also have the owner of Fury of Everything, Stephen Hawking, sitting at number 10. But that's not what I'm interested in. The ones that I'm interested in are the ones who are bolded here, and they're actually chess players. We have Gary Kasparov again mentioned again, the artificial intelligence terminator, or maybe the other way around. And we have Judith Polgar at number eight, the strongest female player in the history of chess. And this still you know, shows a good reason to believe that chess does have a positive effect on human chess, on human brain development. I'm not gonna get into the technicalities of that because let's just leave that to neuroscientists. I don't know anything about those. All right, enough of this fact. Earlier in the speech, I promised you that I'll tell you what chess really means to me. So here it goes. A couple weeks ago, right before I graduated Brown University, I went to a Brown chess club, which is my you know, Wednesday nightly routine. And I played a game with this guy. He looked very mean and ferocious. I'm a pretty scary dude. But <laughs> anyways, the game went on. I got a better position. All my chess pieces were placed superior than his pieces. So I thought I was going to win the game. However, I made a huge blunder towards the end of the game, and I lost all the advantage that I had over the board. Funny how in chess, all you need is one mistake to screw everything up. So I ended up losing the game, and in fact, I got checkmated. So today, I want to tell you what chess really means to me by redefining this word checkmate. The definition of this word is actually very simple. When you win a game, you checkmate. When you lose a game, you checkmate it. So what do you say when you win a game? Yeah, checkmate, right? I want you to remember this word checkmate because I want you to say this word, all of you, at the end of the speech. All right, thank you for cooperating. All right, let's go back to the speech. Where was I? A couple weeks ago, right? A couple weeks ago wasn't the first time I got checkmated. The first time I got checkmated was when I was five years old. Why? Because that's when I first started playing chess. And I still remember, when I was first introduced to this game of chess, I fell in love with it right away. I fell in love with the inexhaustible possibilities of this game and all the wonderful strategies one could employ over the board. Just kidding. When I, saw, when I first saw it, I hated it. The only reason I had to play this game was because my parents were both chess players, so they more or less forced me into this game. So now that I had to play this game, I decided to be very mean like the other guy a couple weeks ago at Brown University Chess Club and checkmate everyone that comes across me. But instead, I got checkmated all the time. 
I remember, age six, I got checkmated by my brother. So I lost my bet and had to wash all the dishes. It was a terrible experience. That's why I still remember. And age seven, I actually checkmated him this time. But I still had to wash the dishes. <laughs> that's, that's something I never understood. Age nine, I got checkmated in the final round of Mongolian National Youth Chess Championship. I lost my medal and burst into tears and went to my teacher, but he just didn't care. Age 11, checkmated again, but this time in the final round of Asian Youth Chess Championship in Singapore. Lost my medal, burst into tears, you know, same old story, but this time my mommy was there for me, so she took a good care of me, so everything went fine. And age 12, I got checkmated by this American boy in the World Championship in Spain. Fast forwarding a little bit, after seven years later, age 19, I met that American boy again, but this time at Brown Chess University Club. Turns out that we both went to the same university. But I'm telling you, my first conversation with him would have been a lot less awkward had I won him seven years ago. And here I am, age 23, got checkmated a couple weeks ago. So you see, I got checkmated countless times in my chess career, however, if there's one thing that I ever learned from playing chess is that every loss brought me one step closer to my next success and every checkmate prevented me from making the same mistake again. You see, it turns out that chess is not so different from life. Both in chess and life, you win some, you lose some. And mistakes and losses in chess is more like failures in life. And we all know it, failing isn't tasty. But remember, every failure you incur in life brings you one step closer to your next success, and every no you receive anywhere brings you one step closer to your next yes. And having said that, checkmating or winning in this game of chess is more like succeeding in this game of life. And I think in order to truly succeed in this game of life, you need to find your true passion. Chess has always been a huge part of my life, and it definitely played the biggest role in shaping who I am today. However, I realized that chess was not my true passion. My true passion was to contribute back to my country. Like many other people coming from a developing country like Mongolia, I always carried a life ambition to make my country a better place in the future. Obviously, there are many ways in which you can contribute back to your country, but in my case, I thought the best way to do it was to obtain good enough education. So I'm truly grateful that I was given an opportunity to study at one of the better universities in the world and later on, given a chance to work at a company that I could only dream of. I'm truly thankful because I know that with these skills and knowledge that I would learn from this experience, I will be able to give something back to my country and be part of Mongolia's next generation. And having said that, I know each of every one of you will succeed in life, and each of every one of you will define Mongolia's future. And just remember, when that time comes, when all, when all of you succeed in life, and when Mongolia becomes the next East Asian tiger, you know what to say. Thank you.